Love. Everybody who loves you and everybody you love will eventually die. <laughs> it's not funny. This is sad and painful. This is my family. You can see here my mom, my aunt, my grandparents, my two big brothers, and I'm the little boy in the middle. Nowadays, it's only me and my big brother. This is sad, but this is part of life. I'm sure that most of you, at one point of your life, ask yourself this question. What is the point of all this? Why do we exist? Some answer it with faith. Some do not have an answer. So I'll try to give you some thought here, which is kind of another way to look at this. We live to live a stamp, and this is a privilege as human beings. A month ago, David Bowie died. So I went to London and visited the spontaneous memorial site, this fantastic place, and I spent hours there reading all the, the notes there. And what drew my attention, I wanted to share with you, is one note on the right side and one on the top left side. On the right side, it says, heroes never die. For people like David Boyd, death does not apply because he continues to live through his music. But if you look on the top left, you will see it's written there, look up here, I'm in heaven. This phrase is taken from his last monumental album, Black Star, which he wrote in the last year of his life when he knew that he was going to die. David Boyd took care of leaving a stamp not only, not only through his life, but also in his death. And then, you know, it moved me so much, I was even twice in London looking at this, that it flashed with sudden light into my soul and I understood that this is the answer to the question. Why do we exist? We exist to live a stamp. Now, not everybody leaves marks 
like David Boy. But all of us leave marks in work, home, family, marks that we have the intelligence as human beings to build into a stamp or a narrative. This is my mom and dad. Just before my mom went to the hospital for the last time, I remember coming home, and she came to me, and she was not sad at all. She knew that it's going to happen. And she said to me, Alam, you know, I'm happy. I thought about it. I lived a full life. My life was full. At that moment, I knew that she understood that death is part of life. Later, I went to the hospital. She was not responsive anymore. She was under heavy morphine tranquility. Yet, I tried to talk to her. And I said to her, you know, Mom, you raised three beautiful children. Believe it or not, she was smiling. She knew that we, the children, are her continuation, her immortality. She left me many things. One of them is the love to Tolstoy's War and Peace, where it says that love is God. Prince Andrei says to Natasha, love is God, and to die means that I, particle of love, shall return to the general and eternal, eternal source. This is really moving. We are particles of love. And I forgot to tell you that particles is really something I do understand about, especially the God particle. I was leading one of the leaders of the group that search and discover for the Higgs boson at CERN in Geneva. But my particles are material particles. Tolstoy's particles are spiritual particles, particles of love. And look what he says. Love is God, and we are particles of love. What does it mean? It means that we are particles of God. God is with us. So Tolstoy's God is kind of spiritual. You cannot prove it scientifically. Either you have faith and you believe it in it or, or don't. But this is the source of the saying. In God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> and data is the food of the scientist. And I think that one of the biggest data sets all over humanity is the one brought by George Smoot, who won the Nobel Prize in 2006. His data is encoded in this picture, which is a snapshot of the universe as it became transparent after the Big Bang, the genesis, the creation. On this data set, George Smoot said, if you are religious, it's like seeing God. So now, think about it. From that moment on, the laws of physics apply. We know to calculate everything in the last 14 billion years, but everything. So what place is left for God here? The place which physics did not solve yet is who pushed the button that started the Big Bang. That's the thing. This is the God of the physicist. So I was wondering, you know, I became curious. If this is the God of the physicist, how is God perceived by non-scientists? So I started to ask people, and then I said, well, I can ask everybody by going to Dr. Google. So I went to Google, and I do it online now with you. So uh, let's press G, God, and now let's wait and see it happening. OK. What is God? God is a white man with a beard. <laughs> no, it's not funny. It could be the reflection of man in God, as written in the Bible. It could be the young and charming and beautiful Jesus, but not necessarily so, because if you look at the creation of Adam by Michelangelo, that's not the young, charming Jesus. This is still a white man with a beard. So I was wondering, just for the sake of the thought, it's a game of thought, I'm not saying anything, right? Just playing in my thought and say, could it be that it's our existence that created God and not vice versa? Could it be that God is not the answer for our existence? Could it be that what we should say is that in the beginning, man created God? 
Could it be that God is a narrative? Whether it's a narrative or not, only faith can tell us, or I don't know what. But narrative has a very strong power. And if you don't believe me, I'm going to tell you a story about the power of narrative. The story starts with Moses, the Moses of the Ten Commandments. A few years ago, long before the discovery of the Higgs boson, I was convinced by friends to go and chat with Moses. You ask yourself, how can I chat with Moses? There's a lady in Tel Aviv, a spiritual medium who channels Moses. I'm a scientist. What is for me to do with going to spiritual medium? But I'm a scientist. I'm curious. Curiosity always wins. So I went to chat with Moses. And while I'm there, she tells me many things about myself, messages from my dead father, and I'm moved, and wow, I'm... And then I said, well, I'm a scientist. I need to test her. So I decided to ask her questions about physics. I decided to ask her about the Higgs boson. This is a picture of the image of the Higgs boson after its discovery. But that was before the discovery, and I asked her questions, and she answered. I mean, Moses answered. And I'm tantalized. How can... Moses know about the Higgs boson if he died 3,000 years ago. I'm completely in a shock. I live there. I go the next day to the plane like I do every other week to Geneva to the laboratory. I sit in the plane. I'm completely high. I don't see anything. I don't understand what's going on. And I sit down in the plane, and I just sit down and write this song. <laughs> Sitting with 200 people on a plane Like particles, they all look the same As if a guiding hand directing from above What seems like random movement is an equation we can solve I go out of the plane, go to the lab, go back, go back to Israel Telling it to people, I'm not myself after a while, a long while, I decided that I want to listen to the recording again of the session because she let me record it. I listen and I'm even more shocked. Do you know why? Because Moses said nothing about the Higgs boson. Moses knew nothing about the Higgs boson. I was telling a story to myself because I wanted to believe in it. I wanted Moses to know. So I built my own narrative with my imagination. You know, if I hadn't gone to her, I would have died believing that Moses knew about the Higgs boson. And then I would tell it to my children, I would tell it to their children, and I would implant it in the genes of my children, and in 150 years, all this country will say that Moses knew about the Higgs boson, this is the proof of God. <laughs> Could religion be like this? Implanted in genes of religious people? There's a research going on on this. Who knows? So, God narrative or not, we don't know, but it seems that we as human beings have more than just the role of reproduction. We have the ability to leave a stamp. There is difference between us and animals. This is my dog, Richard Feynman II, I call him. And he's very smart, he's driving a car, as you can see, because he's a border collie. There's only one resemblance between him and the guy on the right. They both have salt and pepper hair. <laughs> that is the only resemblance. You see, Clooney has already left a stamp on humanity, even though he doesn't have children. That's what I know. I hope I'm not wrong. He doesn't have children, but he left a stamp. Why? Through his acting, through his directing, through, what is it, uh, Nescafe, or how is it called? Nespresso. <laughs> He left a stamp. I mean, in 100 years, he will be written in encyclopedias. Seriously. And why is that? Because he's a human being. Human beings have the ability to accumulate data, preserve it, write it down, and pass it to next generation, and build things with it, build narratives or build things with it. So remember this thing. 
we have the ability to continue to our children with the genes. So our children is us. God is also us. So you cannot use God as an excuse for things that happen to you in your life. You have to take your own responsibility. Moreover, you have to learn from it that if you abuse your children, like we heard before, if you abuse your children, you abuse yourself. And you, children here, even grown-up children who have parents, remember that mistreat your parents is mistreating yourself. So you have to treat nice your parents. And when you go home after this thing tonight, when you go home, you look around you and see where you leave marks and where you can leave marks and use your intelligence to enhance your character and make stamps out of these marks. Use everything you've got. Use your faith or your lack of faith. It's equally valuable to spread your knowledge and bring and, and build your own narrative. Use it. Live to leave a stamp. Live forever. Be immortal. Thank you very much.